The content of this video is for informational purposes only. So seek out professional medical training before performing any medical procedures or treatment on anyone. Today, we're talking about burns, anywhere from minor to severe, how to classify them and also how to treat them. Today we're discussing burns. This is something that some of you have asked us to go over. So we're going to do an overview video today of burns and we're going to talk about the different categories of burns, how to treat them, um, and we're going to go all the way from minor to severe and everything in between. So first off, what is a burn? Well, a burn is damage to our skin and it's not just from something that's hot. This can be a chemical burn. There's a lot of different classifications of burns, but in general, let's think of this as some type of damage to our skin. So before we start classifying a burn, let's take a look at the different layers of our skin because that's going to directly relate to how we classify the severity of a burn. So on our skin, we have three main layers. We have the epidermis, which means above the dermis. Then underneath that, we have, yeah, you guessed it, the, the dermis. So the dermis is the main part of our skin. Epidermis sits on top of that. So everything we see here is epidermis. The dermis is the thickest part of the skin that sits underneath that. Underneath the dermis, we have the hypodermis. The hypo, hypo means low, so lower than or underneath the dermis. Um, that's also called the subcutaneous tissue, but that is under the main part of the skin. So we have these three different layers. Underneath that, we have muscle, tissue, bones, fat, all that fun stuff. So our skin has those three layers and we have everything else underneath that. So when we talk about classifying a burn, they used to use the terms first, second, and third degree burns, and even fourth degree if it went through the skin and got into bones and muscle, but they've kind of gotten away from the first, second, third degree, and we're using a superficial, partial thickness, and full thickness burn, depending on whether it's just the epidermis or the dermis is involved or the hypodermis or subcutaneous tissue is involved. So this classification process depends on how many layers of our skin is involved in the burn. So we have our first degree, our superficial, we have our second degree or our partial thickness, and then we have our third degree or our full thickness burns. And then our fourth degree would be a full thickness burn also involving other deeper tissue like bones and muscle. Now, what types of burns are there? Well, the most common is a thermal burn, and that's what we think of with heat. If you put your hand on a stove or you get burned by fire or you bump your arm on a muffler while you're working on your vehicle, these are all thermal burns because it's a heat source that is now damaging that skin. But there's a lot of other types of burns as well. Chemical is also another common type of burn. When we're talking about a chemical spill or a fertilizer or a powder or something that gets on someone's skin and starts destroying that skin, that's also a burn. But it's not from a thermal process. It's from a chemical reaction from a harsh chemical that's on that skin. Another type of burn is an electrical burn. So if you have a electrical current and a person now is inside of that current from a higher voltage to a lower voltage and that current travels through that person, you can get an electrical burn from that. You also have a friction burn, that's like a rug burn or a road rash. You can also have a cold burn, which is like a severe frostbite from touching something that's really cold. Um, and that will also damage the skin. And radiation is also a category of burn. And this is gonna be something more like UV radiation from the sun, um, which causes a burn, where it's not a direct thermal burn, but it's actually the radiation from the sun that causes that burn. Now, another thing to think about when we think about severity of burns is not just the degree of burns, first, second, third, or partial, full thickness, but also the location of the burns. If someone gets burned on their upper arm, it's not gonna be quite as critical as if they get burned in the palm of their hand, or if they get burned on their feet, or their mouth, or their airway. Some of these more sensitive places, like the hands, where you have a lot of nerve endings, are gonna be more painful, but it's also gonna be more critical for that patient for their long-term outcome to have a good treatment for these burns because uh, that could affect their dexterity, that could affect their job, them being able to provide for their family in the future. So we really have to be careful when someone has burns to the airway, to their hands, to their feet, um, to joints, genitalia, any of that kind of thing is a big uh, factor. So we have to take that into consideration as well and not just the depth of the burn. One more factor of the severity of the burn is how much of the body is burned. Um, 
if you have a small part of your arm that has a third degree burn, that's really bad. It can get infected. It needs treatment. I get all that. But if you have half of your body that's now covered in second degree burns, um, that it may end up being a bigger deal than the small amount of a third degree burn um, just because of the surface area that it covers. All right, so we have a minor burn. Uh, someone has touched the stove, someone has burned themselves in a campfire. So this minor burn should present like a bright red area. It's gonna be very painful. Those nerve endings on the top of the skin have just gotten damaged, but the skin should still be intact. And there's gonna be a lower chance of infection on these because the skin is still mainly intact. There should be no blisters. If we have blisters, that means that the dermis is involved and that becomes a second degree or a partial thickness burn. Treatment for minor burns. First thing is to stop the burning process. If this is a thermal burn, cool this under clean water for about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes. You've gotta stop that burning process. And just simply dumping a little bit of water on there is not gonna stop the burning process. There's still heat that is in the skin, in the arm, um, or the part of the body that's burned, we've got to pull that heat out. So run it under some clean water for five to 10 minutes. If this is a powder, we need to brush that off the patient. We need to try to get a brush and get as much of that powder off the patient as quick as possible. Protect yourself from getting that on yourself because you don't want to be a, a secondary victim to this as well. If this is a wet chemical, typically we're going to flush that off the skin, wash it off with water. We do want to make sure that this is not something that's water reactive. Most of the chemicals we should be coming in contact with are not typically water reactive, so it shouldn't typically be an issue, but just something for you to be aware of. Once we have the burning process stopped, we wanna to try to keep that burn as clean as possible. This is where we can wrap it with some dry gauze to try to keep any other dirt or foreign substances out of that area. The big deal that we have to worry about with burns is uh, temperature regulation. Since our skin regulates our temperature um, with a first degree, it's probably not gonna be that big of a deal. And the second thing is infection. Because the skin is the barrier that keeps all this nasty funk on the outside world from getting inside our body, if that is damaged, there's a chance that we can have bacteria come into our body, cause infection, and now we've got a problem. So we wanna keep this area wrapped. We wanna to try to keep it clean, dry, and try to prevent any infection from happening. One more thing we can do is we can apply something like this burn tech dressing that we put in a couple of our kits. Uh, we can apply this on a first or second degree burn. The gel in this is going to touch the burn and it's gonna help draw any other heat that's in the burn to keep it cool. And that gel also helps with some pain relief on that burn as well. The gel that is on this gauze also prevents the gauze from sticking to the wound, which is great. So when you go to pull it off, it's not stuck into the burn. Um, they, some people will say you can put this on a third degree burn. I don't recommend that at all. If you have skin that is fully open, like a third or fourth degree burn, don't apply any types of gels or anything down in the wound. Um, that will be something that when they get to a burn center, they're gonna have to clean all that out. Um, it's not a good idea. We really would just wanna keep those as dry and clean as possible. All right, so let's talk about partial thickness burns or second degree burns. So these are gonna present with blisters typically. That's kind of the telltale sign for a second degree burn. These we're not gonna treat a whole lot differently than a first degree burn. Um, there's gonna be more skin involved, but most of the time the skin should still be intact. You're gonna have these blisters. Um, we don't wanna pop the blisters because as soon as we do that, we now have a break in the skin. There's a better chance for infection into that wound. So again, we wanna to try to stop the burning process, cool these down, wrap them with a dry sterile dressing and try to keep them as clean as possible. Okay, so let's talk about full thickness burns. And we're gonna be talking about third degree and fourth degree. Um, as soon as the entire layer of the skin is damaged, the skin is now open for infection and it is also a telltale indicator that this person has been exposed to a significant amount of heat or chemical or electricity. Um, so we have to be really careful here. First off, before we dive into the burn treatment, I want you to make sure that we don't skip over some of the important things of this patient assessment. We wanna follow a algorithm for our patient assessment. We can use the NREMT's trauma assessment to guide us through this assessment, which means we're gonna take care of any life threats, we're gonna go over airway, breathing, and circulation, then later down the road, we're gonna start treating this burn. Remember that burns are a distracting injury. They look gnarly, they look terrible, but what's gonna kill the patient immediately is the fact that he's not breathing or that he's bleeding out at the same time he has some burns. So we have to fix these issues first. If we skip over all these things and we go straight into the burn, our patient could be far worse off or even die 
while we are trying to provide care for this burn. So make sure you follow an algorithm, follow an assessment, and go step by step to make sure you don't miss anything on this patient and you can do the most help for this patient. Anytime you've had a significant burn, like a third degree burn, there's always a chance that this patient has burns to their airway, so keep this in mind. You should be monitoring this during your ABCs in your initial part of your assessment. You're gonna be looking into the mouth, looking around the mouth. If this is a thermal burn that we're concerned about, look for any soot around the mouth, any burning, any charring, um, and this will be an indicator that uh, they could potentially have gulped in some of that hot air um, and had that burn down their airway. The airway tissues are much softer, so they're much more susceptible to a burn than our thick, tough skin, so we have to be really mindful of this. If our patient is taking a deep breath of some superheated gases, we could have damage uh, well down into our airway now, and we wanna monitor these with lung sounds, make sure that we don't hear any fluid buildup in the lungs. Um, we wanna make sure that we don't hear any upper airway strider. Um, that strider just means that our upper airway is starting to close off. We have a whistling noise now as our air is trying to move past these obstructions from the swelling. So we wanna to continue to monitor that, not just at the beginning of our assessment, but we wanna come back and monitor these ABCs and the airway specifically over and over on these patients to make sure that it is a patent airway the entire time. When we're looking at the breathing on these patients, we wanna make sure that they're taking adequate breaths. We wanna make sure that if they are a victim of a thermal burn, um, let's say they were near a fire, a car fire, or inside a house fire, we also wanna make sure they haven't inhaled a bunch of smoke or carbon monoxide. If they inhaled carbon monoxide, that will bind to their hemoglobin in their blood and it will basically suffocate them from the inside out. Um, they're still breathing, but that carbon monoxide prevents the oxygen from going where it needs to go. So these patients need some aggressive treatment with some oxygen to be able to purge out some of that carbon monoxide. So again, don't get tunnel vision in the burn. Make sure that you're treating the patient as a whole here. On the breathing, we also have to look out for any full circumferential burns. Any burn that is around the entire torso can become a huge issue for the patient's breathing. Why that is, is because the skin, now that it's burned, it doesn't have the elasticity anymore. It's tough and leathery because it's damaged now. And a lot of the tissue underneath the skin is gonna start swelling. As that swells, it's gonna start constricting the chest. As it does that, when the patient tries to take a breath, there's gonna be a large amount of resistance that patient feels. This is the part of the treatment where an advanced provider uh, may do an escherotomy, where they would actually cut the skin to open that up to allow the uh, chest wall to continue to expand. You'll also see escherotomies on extremities uh, where it may be a full circumferential burn that is now causing compartment syndrome, which is basically think of a tourniquet on an arm now. It is uh, blocking off a lot of the blood flow to that part of the extremity, and they may have to do an escherotomy, cut an incision with a scalpel in the skin to be able to open that up so now that the uh, swelling tissue underneath is not actually occluding blood flow. So we have a third degree burn patient, we've gone through our ABCs, we've taken care of the critical things, and now we're addressing the burn itself. Same as before, we have to stop the burning process. We have to make sure that the heat is removed. We want to make sure that this patient is away from the heat source. We want to get the chemical off the patient, whatever we have to do. If the clothing is covered in the chemical, remove the clothing. Um, if the clothing is around the area of the burn, let's try to remove that too. Don't start picking through the burn and trying to pull stuff out of the burn. If it's burned and kind of embedded in the burn, in that wound, just leave that. They'll have to debride that at the ER or the uh, burn center later. Um, so don't dig around, but anything around that area, we can remove it um, and we wanna try to keep that area as clean as possible. If this person has a third degree full thickness burn, the skin is all the way damaged. We don't wanna start taking a bunch of nasty creek water, muddy water, start pouring it over the wound, trying to flush this and cool this, okay? So we wanna use some clean, uh, sterile saline to flush this. If you have an open wound and you don't have clean water with you to be able to flush that, um, you don't want to just start dumping a bunch of nasty water down inside open wounds like that. So um, let's make sure that we have some clean water to flush this. If not, let's wrap it, keep it as clean as possible, um, and get them to a burn unit. Okay, the burning process has stopped. Things are going to start swelling 
as a response to the body trying to start healing this area that's damaged by the burn. So before it swells, we wanna make sure we take any constricting bands, uh, rings, watches, anything like that off the patient so that they don't get stuck on the patient. So try to take those off early in your patient treatment. One of the big treatments for burns is to keep them clean until they can get to a burn center or as these burns continue to heal. To keep them clean, we wanna wrap them with a sterile gauze or some type of non-porous uh, sheet um, that is pretty clean so we're not adding any bacteria to this wound. Uh, but we want to make sure that it's not like a rough woven gauze that has a bunch of holes in it that we put in that wound um, because that's going to stick to the wound and be a mess when we try to pull that back out. So we want something that doesn't have a lot of holes. It is non-porous. A cheap hack that you can use for something to cover up large burns um, is a saran wrap. So this is plastic, non-porous. It's not going to stick to the wound. They can pull it off easily after the fact um, when they get to a hospital or a burn center. Um, but this is also, because it's non-porous, it's going to keep any nasty debris, dust, anything out of that wound as well. So if you have to, you can put some uh, saran wrap on there to try to keep that area clean. If you apply saran wrap, don't wrap it all the way around an extremity or the body. You want to put a layer on the top of the extremity. Um, that way, as the extremity starts to swell and expand, it doesn't start to become a tourniquet around that arm. So try to put it on the top on the burn, wrap it with some loose gauze to hold it in place or something like that. But you don't want to take this and just start wrapping around the arm so the arm can't expand. Then let's also keep this patient warm. The skin is one of the big thermoregulators our body has, and that's how we regulate our heat. Even on a hot summer day, if you have a patient that has a large area of their body that's burned, they're gonna lose heat and they're gonna become hypothermic even though you're standing there working on them and sweating at the same time. So you've got to keep these patients warm. Your body will lose a lot of fluids from a burn. So it's important to have a EMT, paramedic, physician, um, somebody fairly early on start an IV uh, get some fluids on board and start replenishing those fluids that the body is losing. They are going to use a fluid like a normal saline or lactated ringers. The normal saline, if you are doing a large amount of resuscitation, it is more acidic than lactated ringers and it also has a lot of sodium content in it. So there are going to be some imbalances by flushing the patient full of some normal saline. So lactated ringers is uh, a lot closer to a person's normal pH, so that is more preferred for uh, fluid resuscitation for burn treatment. These patients will also be getting antibiotics because their skin is damaged, and that is our barrier from any bacteria from the outside world getting into our body. Um, we can basically go ahead and assume that some of this charred flesh, some of the outside dirt and debris is now in our body. Um, and our body has a great chance for infection and eventually sepsis if left untreated. So we have to make sure these patients get some antibiotics on board as well. All right, so a quick recap. We have a first, second, third degree burn, which is a uh, superficial, partial thickness, and full thickness burn. Overall, for the treatment of burns, we want to stop the burning process. We then want to keep the area as clean as possible, cover it with a dry, sterile dressing or something like this saran wrap. We want to keep the patient warm and we want to get this patient to definitive treatment as quick as possible. Remember that two of the main functions of our skin is to protect our body from outside uh, diseases and bacteria and also to regulate our temperature. As soon as we damage that skin, now we have outside diseases that can come into our body so we're susceptible to infection and we also can't regulate our temperature so we have to make sure we keep these patients warm all right well that is an overview for burns hopefully some of this information was helpful hopefully you learned something from watching this video um, as always leave a like on this video if you found it helpful that really helps us out if you have any questions over any of the stuff we went over leave a comment down below we'd love to hear from you uh, subscribe to our channel and make sure your notifications are on so you're alerted of any future videos we post. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.